Hi everyone and welcome to the wild side of STEAM where we explore the unusual careers in science, technology, engineering, art, and math at the Smithsonian's National Zoo. My name is Shelly, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'll be your host for today. I'm so thrilled today to be joined by Roche, our media producer at the zoo. Hi Roche and welcome. Hi, Shelly. Um, I, as Shelly mentioned, I'm Roche. Um, my pronouns are he, him, his. And I am the media producer for the zoo, which means that I photograph and film stories about our animals and researchers. Um, and I have been at the zoo for just about four years now. Wow, that's so cool. So what does a normal day look like for a media producer at a zoo? Um, one of my favorite parts is that there is no normal day. Um, many days are behind the computer editing footage and putting together stories that I filmed in the past. Um, but I also am regularly filming veterinary exams, new animals at the zoo. Um, and on occasion, I get to tag along with our scientists into the field. So it really can you know, be anything from being in front of a computer editing to um, you know, following around veterinary, veterinarians as they're undergoing a gorilla procedure and working closely with them. So um, it really can, can range quite a bit. That's really cool that you kind of get a, a little glimpse into every part of zoo life. Um, so how do you utilize science, technology, engineering, art, and math in your job? Sure. I think there's a couple of ways that it fits in and some are obvious and some are less obvious. I, I would say um, very clearly, you know, I have to have a good understanding of um, science, technology, engineering um, and things like that as it relates to the storytelling. So I'm working with um, people who are utilizing this in their everyday experience and I have to figure out how to take what they're doing and translate it into a story, which is then funneling it through an art form in order to be able to, to make it relevant. Um, and then the other less obvious way, I think to many is one that I particularly like is that in order to do my craft well, I have to have a good understanding of engineering um, as it relates to creating visuals. So understanding how lenses work and how colors work um, to be able to create an interesting frame um, really can play a lot into um, you know, how well I can, I can do my job as a storyteller using visual mediums. Um, so there, yeah, there are a lot of ways that it, it factors into my, my career. That's really fascinating. I just want to reiterate a great point that you make is the science background is you're working through your art to sort of tell those stories, the science stories. That's really great. So how did you get into this career as in media production and videography? Sure. Um, so I started off like I'm sure many people um, just enjoying nature documentaries and, um, you know, just always gravitating towards animal stories, which I think is probably a common thing amongst everyone at the zoo. Um, but as I started going into biology and undergraduate and, and studying more and, and doing more research, um, I realized that communications was a big part that was missing to me that you could study an elephant over the course of its lifetime all you want, but in order to save it, you have to make it relevant to the people who need to be engaged to save it. So um, I used my interest in photography at that time and just started applying it to research. And um, from there, I pursued a degree and um, just gained more experience and eventually went into filmmaking. That's so interesting that you started going that science route and then decided that your passion for photography and film and decided to follow that instead. And you're still using, like you said, that science and having an impact on wildlife. Um, so can you talk a little bit about how your career and your job help still help the zoo's mission and saving species? Sure. Um, so I think one of my favorite parts about this job is that it can be made like any film can be made for any number of audiences. And so while we have our social media audience um, that can, you know, hopefully inspire people to care about animals in some capacity, whether that's learning about a new animal or getting to learn more about how an animal engages with its environment or the things that threaten them. But it can also mean that I can make films that we are making for um, people who are decision makers that can impact 
the wild component. Um, and that can be through telling stories about a community that might have the tools after they learn about something or after we help them solve something, or if the public knows how to support what they're doing, they might be able to make choices that can save an orangutan in a palm forest, for example. Um, so it can really run the gamut of, of who we can talk to. And fortunately, I get a direct line to them with every video that I make. I love that, that you're taking all this important research and information and giving it to the public. That's great. So what is the coolest project that you've gotten to work on? But gotta be hard. Uh, so this, is, <laughs> this is always the hardest question um, because it really changes from project to project. Um, every time you tell a story, you become obsessed with that story because you're trying to learn everything you can about it. And so you just really have to love that story in order to do it well. But I think one that sticks out to me is that um, we had one in um, Curacao where we have our coral biologist who um, is trying to save corals using reproductive techniques that we use on humans. And so she uses um, in vitro fertilization and all these other things. Um, but it was really great to work on, not just because it was a coral story in a beautiful place, but because it was a chance to film underwater, which is presents its own challenges and taking electronics into salt water is always risky. And so there's a lot of precautions you have to take. Um, but it was also exciting because it's an animal that a lot of us don't usually think about as an animal. Um, so there's a lot of really interesting components to it. Um, and yeah, it was ultimately an optimistic story. So it's also always nice to get to work on, you know, stories where people save things. <laughs> That's really cool. Was that your first time have, like getting to film underwater? Yeah. It was the first major project that wow. I had done underwater. I had already been scuba certified and, and done a little bit of underwater filmmaking before. Um, but this was the first time where the subject was underwater and um, to make it more complicated, it, um, the story mostly takes place in the middle of the night. Um, the corals are most active for the story we were telling um, after dark. And so you were working on these night dives where light is a challenge and you have to make sure that you're not um, disrupting corals because even though they may not look like it, they are sensitive to light. And so we have to make a lot of technical adjustments to, to make sure that we can film them safely um, and make sure that we're not interrupting their natural process. That's such a good point that you make and that a lot of people don't realize that coral are living animals too. And so you want to be sensitive of their light and their, uh, uh, their sensitivity to um, time of day and things like that. So even when you're filming things like coral, you still need to be kind of aware, as I'm sure you are aware when you're filming the elephants or the pandas as well. Uh, so a common theme that we hear here at the zoo is that every job also comes with what we call other duties as assigned. So things that you didn't necessarily think you were signing up for. What are some other duties as assigned you found yourself doing around the zoo? Sure, I think um, largely what I've been able to do has fit into what I thought I was going to do, which has been great. But that, that category is very large. It can be something from pre-producing where you're writing scripts to figure out how to tell a story to filling out permits to be able to film in certain places um, or working with airlines to be able to safely travel with gear that you know is usually sensitive um, and so there's that side of it but then there's you know the filmmaking side of it that um, presents any number of challenges any given day it could be that the person you're filming is nervous about everything that they want to talk about. So you have to adjust the way that you tell the story um, as it's happening, which is sometimes a challenge, but largely it's all fit into the film realm. Um, and if you would like, I can share um, a little bit of how the editing process looks like, because I think while the, the, the filmmaking part is very obvious to people and they can see what I've worked on, I think a lot of the time that I spend is actually in the edit room um, where um, you know, you're spending four or five times as much in the edit as you are filming it to tell a story. So that might be a good little window into what my day can look like. Um, yeah, so if you'd like to see that, I can share that. I would love to see that. I think our viewers would as well to see kind of what goes into editing and putting together a video. Sure. So let me see if I can get this shared. 
And please let me know when you are able to see my screen. Yeah, we can see that. Okay, so great. So this is a program called Premiere, um, and it's what I use for editing. And what in, in the wrap-up activity, you'll see this final video, so you'll get a chance to see what the final thing looks like. And it's, it's basically a scene in Montana where we have some of our research, and it's just prairie dogs in their environment and some of the animals that interact with them. Um, and so, um, as you can see, it isn't just one video that I've just cut and pasted together. There's all these little clips below it that we have to make sure line up in order to make it feel natural. Because one of the things that um, happens when you watch nature documentaries and things like that is that these animals are, you know, sometimes a mile away. So the the audio that you hear is not actually happening at the same time. Um, so what you have to do is separately record those animals, whether that's hiding a microphone closer to them and walking away or, you know, finding other techniques. Um, and then you have to then later match it so that it feels natural, even though it isn't the actual sound. Um, the other thing that I'll preface this with is that the first shot, as you can see, is a drone shot, wow. which if you had audio, you would only hear the drone. <laughs> so there are a lot of things that you have to do to sort of make it feel natural. So I'll just sort of play this through really quickly. Um, it's a minute long and I'll sort of talk through some of the things that you might hear or see. Wonderful. So here's the prairie dogs running into their little hole. And I'm not sure you'll be able to hear the audio through this, but when you see the final video, you'll be able to see it. Um, but this top line here is all the video clips and everything below it is all the audio files that we're using to make it look and sound natural. So when you watch this, you'll hear prairie dogs chirping in the background, which is a constant sound in the prairie. There's just, you know, for miles, you just hear little chirps. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah. Wow. And you can sort of see here that there are sounds coming in and out, but when you play it back, you may not hear or notice those those cuts. So how close were you like to say those shots of the snakes? How close were you actually to the snake? Um, in those cases, we were pretty close. Um, we happened to be walking through and came across the snake. Um, so we just kind of gave it its space, let it come calm down and then set up the camera. Um, and we were at a safe distance. And that is a snake that is not dangerous to people. So it wasn't a rattlesnake or anything like that. So fortunately, it was one that we still needed to respect its space and let it move freely, but also was something that we didn't feel like we needed to immediately run away for our own safety. So we could just sort of wait and, you know, 20 minutes later, it was comfortable and moving around naturally. So this program that you're showing us is how you sort of edit and put them together. Can you talk a little bit about the things that you think about when putting and stitching these clips together and the audio that you use, and maybe the background music that you choose as well, how you make those decisions? Sure. Um, so there's any number of choices that you can make when making a video, which is what's really another component that's really exciting. If you and I had the exact same footage, we would come up with totally different results. I think everybody has their own preferences and styles, um, but it really goes down to every step of it. I mean, in pre-production, you're making choices, which means that before you're actually shooting, how you're planning it. So that can be the type of camera you're using or the lenses you're using or um, the season that you're filming in um, that you're choosing to tell your story. Um, but then when you're filming, there's just millions of choices <laughs> that you can make. And that can be, uh, you know, from where you're positioning the camera and how often you're moving it around so everything doesn't look like it's coming from one angle because if everything's in one angle, then you have a hard time editing from one shot to another. So you have to find different positions to film the same thing um, and make sure that you're, you're sort of doing that. And then the most amount of choices happens in the edit where um, you have, you know, this, the footage that I just shared was filmed over the course of three different trips to Montana. We were filming a lot of other things but after those three trips, I pulled footage from each of those to create this one scene from this one prairie dog town um, that exists in real life that we just sort of needed to um, gather all the footage over the course of time to, to be able to see the things we we're able to see. Um, and so that, you know, you end up with, you know, tens of hours of stuff that you're trying to condense down to a minute. And really, you can't 
you can make as many number of choices as you want and the music can help make it feel like a one one good piece or it can make it feel very you know put put together or not um, depending on the style of music so if i put heavy metal to this that would definitely you know create a different vibe to this that might be more in the comical reign and you know you could make a video with like fun facts popping up that feels very different to a very specific audience um, but usually since we're talking to so many people, I try to pick music that fits into the environment. So stuff that's, you know, calm if it's in that sort of a scenario, or if it's a scene where we're running through, we had a shoot, we we're running through a jungle for most of the day and it was very hectic and, and things were, you know, very chaotic. So it was trying to find music that captured that energy. So it was a little bit faster paced. So I try to use it to support what you're already seeing rather than try to make someone feel a certain way um, in a very um, over the top kind of way, which might make more sense in a Hollywood film, but maybe less so when you're trying to enjoy, you know, prairie dogs in Montana. <laughs> but I love that those little decisions help produce and tell the story, right? And that's where sort of your artistic eye comes in. I love that. Um, so what sort of special classes or schooling did you need or take to help you in this career? I would say that one of the, the best choices that I made unintentionally for this career was to first get my undergraduate degree in a science. Um, I studied biology in undergrad and I um, pursued research initially and started working at a conservation organization. Um, and all of those things really helped me understand the things I wanted to tell stories about. So once I decided to go, I later went to film school. Um, I got a master's in fine arts at um, Montana State University for science and natural history filmmaking, which is obviously a very specific field. Um, but it was basically meant to to help take science and turn them into stories because it doesn't always translate very easily. And so there's a lot of work that goes into making a story accessible um, and interesting to a wide number of people. And so um, that degree certainly helped, but I would say that um, the nice thing with this uh, field is that if you are a good storyteller and that's something that you can gain with practice and um, you know watching things and research and all sorts of things like that um, you don't necessarily need a degree um, in a very specific arena like you don't need a film degree you don't need to have a biology degree um, it's a field that really respects original storytelling and so um, while those things can help depending on the type of person that you are and how you best learn um, it's also a field where if you just practice and go to film festivals and watch a lot of content you might start to have your own original you know print on a on a style that that can really help you in this career. Um, no one has ever asked me for my degree from a from a resume standpoint. Um, it really is the experience that should speak for itself. That's great. And you touched on this a little bit, but if you were giving advice to any of our viewers or any other young people who might stumble across this in the future, any advice to them if they're interested in getting into this as a career? Absolutely. I, I would say that there's two things that I would highly recommend. And the first is to practice with whatever tools that you have. And that can be from, you know, writing a, a narration for video, or that can be, you know, just sort of imagining what a story would be and scripting it. Um, and if you have the tools, and that can be something like a cell phone or a standard, you know, camera that has a video function. Um, I've seen amazing stuff shot with cell phones that has, you know, worked just as well as anything else, depending on the type of story you're trying to tell. Um, so that's something that you could practice in your backyard or, a, you know, a local park um, and just look for wildlife. The, the great thing about this field is that it is everywhere. And so it's really how hard you're willing to look. Um, so practice, 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 like, like that, there's no way around that at any stage in your career. Um, and the other thing that I would highly recommend is reach out to people who make films that you've enjoyed. So um, most of us, it's a very small community of people that make everything from planet Earth to the things that you're watching from the National Zoo's site to NASA videos. Um, you know, they're all 
the small same small group of people. And so we always like answering questions, taking on mentors and things like that. So just our mentees, sorry. Um, so just feel free to reach out to us whenever you see something you like. And hopefully, you know, if that person has the time and availability, they can answer some questions for you or give you some more specific tips. That's great. So it really sounds like, you know, everyone really has a story to tell. So it's just about finding a way to tell that story. I love that. Um, so working in a zoo where our mission is to save species, we focus on a lot of different conservation issues, right? We want to, you know, protect our corals and our coral reefs, um, you know, uh, prevent deforestation, things like that. What is your favorite uh, conservation passion, if you will? Um, this might sound very similar to everything else I've been saying, but I, I, I think it is storytelling. Um, I think it's something that helps conservation tremendously if done well. Um, and I think it's a component of it that can apply to any number of topics. Um, for example, I started off studying elephants when I was an undergrad and I loved doing that work. Um, but fortunately there's also a ton of other passionate people doing that work. And so that work continues. Um, but by moving into storytelling, now I get to help those kinds of stories or help tell those kinds of stories, as well as stories about frogs and bats and corals and pandas. And so it really is a different component of conservation altogether um, and a skill set that can be applied to the general way that people interact with conservation, um, because ultimately the scientists and researchers need to do their work really well in order to make it happen. But then you also need the public and decision makers to be able to take that information and figure out how to use it. And so that's where I feel like storytelling can play a really important role. I love that, thanks. Now we have one final question before we move on to our live Q&A portion. And I ask all of our guests this, working in a zoo, we obviously have a very diverse collection of animals. What is your all time favorite animal at the zoo and why? Um, so again, this is also one of the hardest questions as I imagine is for most people at the zoo. Um, but again, I, I think I would have to go with coral. I think at the zoo, we have the nice little coral exhibit in Amazonia um, that if you haven't gotten the chance to see it when things are safer and we're able to reopen, I would highly recommend checking it out. Um, it's this beautiful little corner where, you know, a lot of our animals you are hoping to get to see, but sometimes they're sleeping or hiding around a corner and not always the most accessible to see but the corals are always there. And to me, it's the animal that I have the hardest time imagining um, what it's like to have that experience of being a coral. So it's just really amazing to just watch them and think about them as animals and see them in their space, interacting with other things that are in their space. Um, and so I just, I always find it very calming and relaxing to just go look at coral and think about them as animals. So. Yeah, that would, that would be my favorite. I agree. It's a very, very relaxing place in the zoo to just, you can hear the water filter going and to watch them sort of sway. Um, that's really great. All right. So just a reminder that the Q&A is open. So continue to drop your questions. We have so many good ones in here. Um, so you mentioned that filming the coral is one of your favorite projects you worked on. Uh, were you able to film the corals during spawning? Um, yes and no. So this question is one of the many decision makings or decision making processes that we had to go through. So I was filming for eight days and the window for spawning, which is what we were trying to film, is about 14 days over the course of two months. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. Um, and so it was a little bit of a gamble uh, as to when it was going to happen. So we filmed every night. We got lots of beautiful coral content and um, footage with our scientists. And we filmed the same places during the day so we could see a lot of the life that goes around it. Um, but the entire time we did not get the spawning and then we had to come back home. And so what I ended up doing was I spent two days training our scientists with cameras that they had. Um, to use it well, to film certain shots. I created a shot list for them. I created a set of questions for them to consider 
to help them understand how to best capture it. And fortunately that paid off. And when it did eventually spawn, they were there and they captured it. And so, um, so they constantly write back and they tell me how much they're filming now, which is also really great as a storyteller, knowing that more people are trained to film things well is going to only help people tell more stories about what they're working on. So I, while I would have loved to have filmed it myself, I'm also really excited that the scientists were involved with that process. That's awesome. We're all on the same team. So if you can share that knowledge, that's great. Um, where can people see some of the films that you've worked on? Is it at the zoo's website? I did mention in our little blurb on the website that you are an award-winning uh, filmmaker. Yeah, so most of the content is on the zoo's channel. So that's Facebook, YouTube. Um, many, much of it can be found on the website. Um, and then in some cases, some of our more in-depth storytelling will submit those to film festivals. Um, so those are anywhere between five and 10 minute long short films. Um, and we usually do two or three of those a year. And those will screen at some festivals throughout the country. So they've screened at the DC Environmental Film Festival here at, in DC, but it's also screened at um, some festivals that are on tour like Wild and Scenic Film Festival. They take their films on tour. So that screened um, you know, throughout California and the West. Um, but also I think recently they had a screening, um, I guess it was this past March, February or March, they had a screening of our choral film at the South Pole. So that was really exciting um, to have a film screened in Antarctica. Antarctica. <laughs> so it's, yeah. That's really great. Um, we have a question in the chat as well. Did anyone inspire you to get into filmmaking? Um, that's a great question. I think um, one of the things that I was fortunate enough to do was surround myself with a lot of um, science literature growing up. Like I read a lot of E.O. Wilson books and things like that. I had a great biology teacher in high school. Um, and to be honest, one of the challenges is diversity in the field. There's um, not a lot of people who are um, from South Asian descent, um, which is where my family's from. And so there are some, certainly some obstacles of figuring out how do you find the right resources to get in because it can be a very expensive field to get into. It's a lot about who you know, um, but fortunately that's been changing quite a bit. So um, as I mentioned earlier, as my advice, just reach out to people. That's something that I was intimidated by, by when I first started because I didn't see people that looked like me or had similar experiences. But I think once you start reaching out to people, there's there's much better attempts to correct some of those problems, but also there are way more people willing to help um, find a spot that um, I, I wasn't aware of before I started. So I would say, um, yeah, I would say it was a, a, a lot of different people, but I would say my biology teacher in high school was a big influence on the path that I chose and the topics I became interested in. That's great. I love that you mentioned representation. Of course, that's very important, especially in STEAM and um, in every career that we encounter. Um, we have a great question in here. Have you ever been scared while filming? <laughs> um, absolutely. I would say that if I, if I do everything as well as I can while planning a shoot, the, the ways I can be scared are hopefully pretty minimal, but um, it really is case by case because you're working with wild animals in a wild place. So um, yeah, I, you know, we, we try not to take risks. There's one story where I can, that comes to mind that I was particularly scared. And I think this will be fully apparent um, to all of you as we are in the time that we're in now. Um, a few years ago, I was working on a story in Myanmar with some of our global health scientists and they're studying things like um, how pandemics can arise and where viruses live and how people interact with them to try to reduce some of those interactions and hopefully prevent a lot of what we're experiencing now. And so we were in this one cave, um, we, they were basically taking blood samples of bats um, to try to identify any potential viruses that they might carry. So we're in these hazmat suits and totally wearing the correct PPE. So we're as safe as possible. Um, and these caves are beautiful. There are these, you know, couple thousand year old Buddhist temples that are built into these caves and people go visit them. And that's one of the challenges is that they are such sacred sites and really important culturally, but they're also a place where people are interacting with wildlife in a way that might 
not be um, great for spreading diseases. And so we're in these hazmat suits walking through and then we go, we round this corner and then we have to go through this tight squeeze that's maybe as wide as one person. Um, and it's almost a hundred degrees and humid and the cave is just full of guano. So it's just fat droppings everywhere. Like it's your, your foot is sinking like ankle deep into it and you're just moving through and like my goggles were foggy and just all the walls are just guano. So I'm, I'm not physically touching anything because I have gloves and suits on and everything, but it was just a very claustrophobic, very hot um, experience where you're just having headlamps that are shining your way through and just hoping that they don't give out. I mean, again, everything we did was with the scientists planning everything ahead. So we were actually safe but it was just the point where it definitely did not feel safe no matter how much planning went into it. Um, but fortunately we had experts that were helping us. I didn't just wander into a cave by myself. <laughs> this sort of leads into another question I'm seeing here in the Q and A is what are some of the challenges that you experience during filmmaking, especially with live animals? I think there's a couple of ways to answer this. I would say, um, you have to be prepared for anything and that can be really challenging because you're focused on carrying an electronic device that is very expensive through a place that you don't want to drop it. You need to make sure everything works. Um, you're worried about how things look and sound on the camera, but then you're also running and there's roots that you can trip on. Or if you're in the water, there's salt water that you need to make sure needs to stay out of your equipment and that everything is as safe as possible. Um, so it's sometimes hard to pay attention to your surroundings because you're so focused on the camera itself um, and what you're trying to do with it. Um, and then I would say from the zoo side, it's a, a, a very different challenge where, um, as I, I think the keepers can attest to, it's every time you're trying to film, an animal decides that it wants to lay down or hide or start pooping. And so you really, you might have to be very patient to get the 10 second shot that you need for a video. It, sometimes that can take three or four days of going back and forth to the same spot and just waiting for the right moment. Um, I had an experience a couple weeks ago where we were trying to get footage of our bison and one of them just refused to stand up for been every time I went in to go film. So it took several days for me to get that one shot that we needed. And that was just a photograph. So didn't even need moving images, <laughs> but it was, it was hard to do that, so. If there's one yeah. I've taken away from my career at the zoo, it's that you can't force these animals to do anything. We're on their time. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so another great question in here that you've alluded to a little bit is if someone is just starting out, um, obviously we've talked about with the zoo, we have a lot of fancy equipment, but for someone just starting out who maybe doesn't have um, the capacity to buy fancy equipment. What are some essential things that you think someone should start with? Equipment. That's a great question. Yeah, that's a great question. I think, you know, unfortunately it is not entirely free. Um, that's, uh, that's one of the challenges, but um, I would say there's two routes to go. There's, or to consider. One is there's parts of the career that are not dependent on a camera. Um, so that can be from producing and that can be from you know and what you're doing as a producer is helping plan a shoot and organizing a story and making sure that everything goes through so that can just be like you know if you're in your backyard how would you go about a shoot and um you know how would you tell a story about a hawk that frequents your neighborhood and so just you know writing a story and thinking about how you'd go about doing it that is a skill set that is extremely valuable in this field. Um, and there are entire jobs that are just doing exactly that. Um, same with editing. There, you know, you could be an editor where you have software, so you would, might want to look into software to play with. Um, but there are sites where you can download free footage um, to just play with and start you know, gaining those skill sets and storytelling. But I would say if you're interested in the filming component of it, which I'm guessing many people are, um, a cell phone does wonders. I, I think you just have to figure out how to use that tool to your advantage. So you may not be able to zoom into things if you're trying to film a wolf that's two miles away. So you might have limitations like that. But then what you can do is think about the story from 
the stand standpoint of a camera. How can you turn the camera on yourself to help narrate a story? So it doesn't matter if you can see it very well in the background that there's, you know, a hawk or a wolf or whatever it might be that you're trying to tell a story about, but instead you're part of that story and helping tell it. So say a cell phone is definitely a great place to start. I would say the next um, affordable option are um, SLR cameras. So your standard um, cameras that has interchangeable lenses, which are not cheap, but I would say that they are way less expensive than some video cameras that um, many professionals use. And to be honest, many professionals use those cameras way more often than you might guess. Um, there's, I have some friends that worked on um, planet Earth, for example, and they had um, many instances where they had just rigged up cameras. They had spent about one to $2,000 on um, to get many of the shots that ended up in, in, in the video, um, while a typical video camera might cost $10,000 plus. So, so really look at still cameras because a lot of them can do really great video now. That's really great. Now you mentioned, talked a little bit about this, but there was a question of whether you're a director, but it sounds like you're a director, you're a filmmaker, you're a producer, and you sort of wear all of the hats that come with that. Yeah, so um, right now at the zoo, we are a team of one doing the video production. So that is, um, yeah, I'm organizing our gear and making sure batteries are charged. I'm copying cards after the end of a shoot to make sure everything's organized well. Um, I'm planning shoots, doing permits, filming, editing, doing sound mixing, animation when things call for it. So it's definitely, you know, depending on the type of work you want to do, it um, could mean that you get to specify or it means that you do a little bit of everything. And at the zoo and many smaller, like um, not necessarily smaller, but I would say, you know, nonprofits, um, government organizations, things like that, a lot of times they're pared down and you're expected to do a lot of it. Um, and if you are working at something larger, like the Smithsonian Channel or um, things like that, then you might get to be just a cinematographer or just an editor um, and things like that. So um, who knows what the future holds? We, you know, in, in five years time, 10 years time, we might be looking for new people to bring on and turn this into a team. Um, so who knows? You could potentially join the, the zoo and help me out. <laughs> That's great. Um, and for our final question from the q and I know there are a lot more in here, but we are running out of time. Um, did you have to take more than four years of college to work at the zoo? I know you mentioned this briefly. Um, I, I happened to have gone through more than four years of college um, for my experience, but I would say that um, I, I've definitely worked with a lot of really talented filmmakers that would be absolutely qualified to do this um, with four years of college. I would say it's definitely helpful to have um, a degree in, especially for storytelling in this realm, um, a degree in the types of stories you want to tell because one of the biggest challenges is working with a veterinarian or a scientist or a keeper and taking what they're saying as the most important parts of the story. But then I have to then ultimately decide how I fold that into a story, which may not be as simple as the way that they talk about it in um, the way that they perform their duties. So having a degree either in storytelling or in a subject matter that you're really interested in can really, really be helpful. Um, and then a further degree is totally up to you. For me, it was really great because that's how I learn and how my brain processes things was to have you know, my master's degree was three years. So I had dedicated time where I could practice and I was focused on doing that really well. Some people are able to do that while holding other jobs and just do that on the side with side projects or um, through internships and gain the experience that way. So there's definitely a lot of routes once you get past your undergraduate degree. So I wouldn't say that further school is necessary, but it might be something um, worth considering depending on how you learn. That's great. Well, Rush, thank you so much for joining us today for the Wild Side of Steam. I learned so much about storytelling and videography um, and how you're taking these the scientists and their research and their work and making it digestible for the general public and all of our zoo guests. I love that.
So thank you again uh, for joining us and thank you to Roche for the wonderful insight into your career. We hope you will join us for the next installment of the Wild Side of Steam on Friday, January 8th, where we will get an inside look into population ecology. So on behalf of the Smithsonian's National Zoo and Conservation Biology Institute, we hope you have a wild day. Bye.